Um, welcome, everybody. I, I appreciate you uh, coming to hear about this topic. Uh, my name is Christopher Doty. Uh, I'm the vice chair at the University of Kentucky. Um, there are a few other people uh, that have contributed towards this presentation. Uh, first and foremost, really the engine behind what we do is Dr. Manfredi. Um, she's had a long career in uh, wellness. Um, she had like a knee replacement operation um, and has been laid up uh, longer than she expected uh, and it just traveling was not uh, gonna work for her. So um, she won't be joining us. Um, other people that, um, there's some background information that we're gonna have some discussion with a panel, uh, address questions. We also have some questions that we can talk about to reinforce the learning points. Um, I guess now is a good time as any to, 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 for people to introduce themselves. So, um, LA? Hey everyone, I'm um, Ellie Alvarez. I'm the uh, Director of Wellbeing at Stanford. And uh, go in order here, Jay. Hey guys, uh, Jay Ron Pye, I'm one of the faculty members over at Brown. Uh, Lois? Hi, I'm Lois Fisher. I am no longer in Philadelphia. I am now in Orlando. I uh, have the Health Emergency Medicine Program. And then um, Lori um, was uh, one of uh, Rita and I, and Lori have been working with some iteration of this uh, for several years. Um, we've sort of added some people in. Um, uh, Lori uh, passed away um, in November. Uh, she was um, an associate program director, uh, very active in CORD, um, and uh, also very active at, at UCSF Fresno. Uh, she was like the associate dean of GME, uh, was an assistant dean of student affairs, I think, for a while. Um, and uh, really has been uh, a force uh, within bringing um, sort of the spotlight onto uh, destigmatization of uh, mental illness. Um, but unfortunately, um, um, she passed uh, after a somewhat prolonged battle with, uh, with cancer. Um, and just a wonderful human being. So um, we would like to dedicate this to her and her memory and all the work that she brought to this. Um, there are no disclosures. Um, well, there's no drug company, no device. We're not talking about any of that stuff. Um, these are our objectives. Basically, um, it is a panel. We will be talking mostly around those questions. I'll provide some background information and then uh, uh, hopefully, a, a, well, not hopefully, I will provide a story at the beginning to sort of get you a little more anxious. I believe in that whole Yerk Dodson sort of curve to make you bring you a little higher up on the anxiety scale so you you know, pay attention. Um, we'll talk about the impact of physician suicide, second victim syndrome, uh, and then the last thing is um, think about uh, different things in our environment, our own personal environment, and systems the, that we may be able to affect change. Just the facts of another physician suicide. This is Lori, by the way. We start with the facts because that's what we've been trained to do to collect facts and data, and then make educated decisions based upon those facts. So just the facts. It was May 5th, 1996. I was a PGY2 in an emergency medicine residency program. My fiance was also a resident at that program. He had the day off. I was working swing shift in the emergency department. I got off at 11.30, made it home by about midnight. And as I opened the door to our house, I knew that something was wrong. I could smell gas and vehicle exhaust. And as I hurried to the garage, I already kind of knew what I would find, but it was still a shock. I found my fiance dead on the ground of the garage. So what do you do in a situation like that? Well, you call 911 and they'll ask you, what's your emergency? And so I told them that I found my fiance dead in the garage and I think he died of carbon monoxide asphyxiation. They offered to instruct me on how to do CPR. I told them I already knew how to do that, but didn't think it was correct in the situation. His face and lips were blue. 
and rigor mortis has, had already set in. Soon after that, I could hear th the sound of sirens as police, fire, ambulance all arrived at our home. And then all of a sudden, my home became something else. Not just the scene of my fiance's death, but a crime scene. I was not allowed to stay there. I was not allowed to be with his body. I was asked to find someplace else to stay for the night. So I did what I thought was best and I returned to my home away from home in the emergency department. One of the ambulance supervisors took me back to the hospital where I found myself in an unusual position in the quiet room, in the room we place our patients' families to break bad news. And it was still going to be my role to break bad news, but it was going to be over the phone to my family, to Steve, my fiance's family, and to friends. Now remember, it's now about 1 or 1.30 in the morning, so this news is coming at the worst of times. Luckily, my family only lived about two and a half hours away. And as soon as they got my call, they got in their car and drove to pick me up in the emergency department. We ended up in a hotel room somewhere around five o'clock in the morning, which was going to be just a place to stay because there was going to be no sleep that night. Following that fateful night, the next several days were a haze of his family arriving, of planning a funeral, of burying my fiance. And those are just the facts. But a life is so much more than just the facts. Steve was a brilliant medical care provider who cared about his colleagues and his patients. His loss deeply affected family, friends, the people he worked with, and the patients he cared for. So this talk about suicide and suicide in our physician population is not just about the facts. It's about lighting up the darkness and talking about these experiences with each other. Uh, so my name is Christopher Doughty. Um, I spent most of my academic career in New York City and about 12 years ago transitioned to the University of Kentucky um, where I was the program director there, all told for about 15 years. Uh, and this came, uh, this event, um, and I'm going to talk to you about, came about 14 years into me being a program director. So it was right at the end of my tenure. Uh, and had a lot to do with uh, sort of hanging up my, my boots as a program director. This is Carlos. Uh, Carlos was a UK medical student. I knew him uh, fairly well. Some of you may have heard me talk about this before. I, I talk about Carlos before I talk about physician suicide. Um, great uh, guy, good medical student. I was tickled uh, when Carlos matched into our program. I was very happy. Um, he was sort of a goofy kid and uh, really cared about what he was doing. He was gonna be a first generation uh, college graduate, first generation physician. Um, in December of Carlos's second year, um, I realized that he was struggling where he had not been struggling before. And I pulled him into my office and I talked to him for a little while uh, and it became pretty apparent that he had become acutely dysfunctional over his mother who was sick. Um, she had bad liver disease uh, and was in a nursing home, basically, uh, in her uh, mid-40s um, in northern Kentucky. We were able to get her transferred uh, to the University of Kentucky, um, you know, a coordinator care referral hospital, and then eventually she got admitted to the ICU about 36 hours later. 
Um, I met with Carlos quite a bit over the next several weeks. I put him on administrative leave because he was, wasn't really safe to see patients. Um, and I got a call um, that, uh, from the intensivists who I knew, and, and they said, hey, we're worried about Carlos. We haven't seen him in two days, and, and this is the only two days he's not been in the ICU. Um, I would placed him on some administrative uh, research elective, like made up rotation in the second year, which didn't exist, so he could you know, spend time with his mother. Um, and I said, well, I, I, don't, I don't know where he is. Um, and they said, well, we had a goals of care discussion two days ago, and I hadn't seen him since. So as physicians, we know what that means, right? The goals of care discussion, where we're going to talk about palliative care instead of, instead of curative care. And uh, it was more than Carlos could bear. In an acute grief reaction, he went home, and he, and he took his own life. Um, the impact on the program, the impact on me personally, uh, I have trouble articulating in a lot of ways. And this is really the only, the only image that, that I could talk up, that I can sort of come up with that explains what happened in our program uh, with 30, well, make that now 29 residents. Um, Close-knit group um, and uh, relatively smallish faculty, 25, 30 uh, faculty members. Um, we were absolutely decimated. I was absolutely decimated professionally. It was the worst day of my professional life. Um, I f feverishly, over the next couple of days, um, sort of started learning as much as I could about this. And, and when I first read the statistic that 400 doctors a year die by suicide, I thought, well, OK, that's not too bad. Um, I guess. I mean, that's higher than I would expect it to be. But, but I mean, it's. I mean, how many docs are in the country? I mean, that's. And I thought, wait a minute. UK has 130 medical students that they graduate every year. So we have to have three UK medical schools must exist in this country to make up every year for the attrition secondary to suicide. We have to have three medical schools. Just going to say this again, to graduate a class every year in this country to make up for the attrition due to suicide. When I think about it on those terms, I find that number staggering. Staggering. And when you look into the number, of course, underreported. And we can talk about that if we have time, uh, but there's a study that comes from. Up to 10% of fourth year students and in interns consider suicide, and you as a physician have two times the risk. Uh, that your neighbor does uh, of taking your own life. So this is an occupational hazard. And we have a culture uh, that really prevents people that need help from getting help or feeling like they can ask for help. So what we did, I was not part of the study, what they did uh, was take some physicians and dichotomize them uh, based, based with high or low pH uh, Q9 scores, which is a depression index. So people that are more depressed, People that are less depressed. So these are people that are less depressed and people that are more depressed. So we see pretty consistently that the people that are more depressed are less likely to seek help, more likely to feel ostracized, more likely to feel disconnected from their coworkers, um, more likely to feel ashamed or like they're going to be blamed. Right. So we have a culture where the people that are most at risk are the least likely to seek help or get help, and the most likely to feel isolated. And we'll talk about isolated in a second. In fact, less than a second. When you look at the social science literature, the feeling of isolation, the feeling of being alone, loneliness, is an independent risk factor for death. How much so? More than excessive drinking, more than obesity, more than air pollution, right? So, so we talk about obesity all the time as being bad for our patients, bad for ourselves. The helicopter moms, the Karens of the world, are all concerned about air pollution for their children, right? Here are the true risks, right? In this country, it seems to me that we're all wound up about theoretical risks and not wound up enough 
about true risks to ourselves, to our children, to our patients. So I put this forward to begin to frame this conversation about what we're going to talk about. Um, we're going to move forward. I, I do have some resources. We'll put these up in a second. Um, uh, I know that, that some of our questions may come to these resources. So with that, I'm going to invite our panel up. Um, I think we have four of us. And I am going to run around with a mic. All right. So I have, um, I have some questions. Um, first of all, uh, does anybody have any questions they'd like to talk to the panel? Or we, uh, the panel can also uh, talk about their uh, relationship um, to this subject matter. Maybe we'll start with that. Uh, Like no? No. All right. <clears throat> Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. All right. Um, so again, once again, my name is Jay Ron. I am one of the faculty members at Brown. <clears throat> I originally got involved with this group um, because I was the chair of the uh, uh, sorry, the Animal Wellness Committee uh, a couple of years ago as a resident. Um, ultimately, what got me involved uh, specifically on this topic was the fact that through my residency training, before residency training, um, I've coped with depression. And there was a point during my intern year um, where I remember very clearly I was at a holiday party and uh, I was there with my partner. And one of our APPs came up and shook my hand, her hand, and was like, this is the happiest, most enthusiastic question you can have. I wish we had a dozen more like you. Um, I was in my psychiatrist's office a week before saying that I don't see me finishing residency because I can't imagine a future beyond the next six months. Um, it became this topic of like my psychiatrist asking me what are the things that give you joy that you want to live for and I would just stare blankly and say I don't want to put my family through losing me. And it was a point in my life where I didn't actually have anything I felt that kept me going and yet, by every measurable metric, I was doing great. Like, clinically, I was doing great. I was picking up extra shifts. I was moonlighting. I was involved in a national committee. Um, so nobody gave me any issues. And um, eventually, I realized that this conception that a lot of people have of what a depressed person is as being this like withdrawn person who can't function, who isn't thriving, isn't necessarily the case as to what's going on. And there are plenty of people out there who are highly functional and professionally succeeding who might personally struggle. Um, and it became something that over time, I got a little bit better about talking about in the hopes that people would understand that depression can have a lot of different faces and making sure that people have resources for that is important regardless of how they might see it. Um, I just want to acknowledge also that you had a ton of choices to go to different uh, talks right now, um, and you chose to come here. And we didn't even sugarcoat the topic, like the topic specifically the title side, physician suicide. So for you being here, I just want to um, acknowledge that because uh, thank you. Um, I, I have gotten to this uh, group in many um, ways. Uh, I met Lois, uh, who the uh, Council of Residency Directors. Um, in the end, uh, where she worked with the National Physician Suicides uh, Awareness Day. Um, I'm also the, the, the wellness committee chair at, at SAEM. Um, I've been one of the peer supporters at Stanford. And I can tell you from that perspective that um, over the past maybe five years at least, um, I can predict this. Every month, despite how big our academic center is, we have less than five people reaching out, not about having uh, worries about depression or having worries about having suicidal thoughts or just anything that's related to the trauma that we experience, right? The thing that we deal with uh, from the academic side, all the expectations and, and the failures, like I screw up a lot, right? And, 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 and nobody, right, not a lot of people, I can, I can say, and so when you talk about like 400 physicians dying a year, it's a little bit more than one per day 
And I would imagine that there's going to be a lot more. And with the pandemic uh, going on, like I just want to take this opportunity for me being here. Like I'm, I'm really grateful to be able to talk about this, to also share with you the work of Dr. Amanda Deutsch, who's led the Stop the Stigma EM Month, uh, which is uh, um, a mental health awareness efforts uh, that is not just SAEM, but actually like across uh, several national organizations. So I'll pause there because I know there's a ton of other questions later on. Hi, I'm Lola Swisher, and I got involved in the topic of physician suicide um, in an obvious way when things happened with Carlos and uh, Chris wrote an open letter to the court about shining a light and speaking its name from suicide. Um, but my involvement in thinking about suicide went back much further than that. And 16 years before um, Carlos, my daughter had a little brain tumor, and I felt very responsible that I was not a good mother, I was not a good doctor. How, how could it possibly be that I let a orange grow in my daughter's head? And I worked, walked right down that suicide uh, journey, and at work would say, there's nothing going on that 100 units of insulin wouldn't cure. I also happened to play with insulin in, in the department at the time to see if I could get take it out and whatever we found out. Um, and we didn't talk about it very well. I wondered if we had been more open about that when I was going through my trials, maybe we would have as many people struggling in that loneliness. Just to, to amplify that, because Lois has told this story so often, I, I know it, but, but just to, to spread out one piece of what she said, you know, when Lois would sign out as an as a attending physician, see, people would say, well, how are you? And she said, it's nothing that 100 units of insulin wouldn't cure, right? So she said that to people, right? And, and nobody, at least, you know, that nobody sort of said, well, what, what do you mean by that, Lois? Like, what, t tell me more about that, right? We, it is not safe to, to, to investigate the people that, uh, you know, that are blatantly asking for help. That was, a, that was a call for help, right? We can all recognize it for what it was. It was a call for help. It was somebody saying, uh, you know, I, I, I'm struggling. I'm hurting, and I need your help. Um, so I think a lot of what we need to do is, is to destigmatize it, um, and for that conversation to be acceptable on both sides, right? It needs to be okay for somebody to say, you know what, I'm, man, I'm on, I'm on the struggle bus. Like, I'm, I'm really having a tough time. And that needs to be okay, because right now, in a lot of places, that's not okay to say. And it also needs to be okay uh, to hear that and to be able to say, well, okay, all right, well, let's, you know, I, I can't, we can't get into this right now, but why don't, we, why don't we have coffee tomorrow or whatever? Like, it needs to be normal on both sides. So let's, let's talk a little bit about that. I have some questions. Um, let me lay down some, a little, a little ground rules, right? So we have, um, any people, anyone that wants to ask a question or tell a brief story, that's fine. I would ask you to keep it to two or three minutes uh, so that everyone uh, has a chance to participate. Um, and the same rules apply uh, to, you know, to, to me and, and the panel. Um, we'll try to keep it brief. Um, and then uh, there's lots of material here. We'll run out of time before we run out of things to talk about. Does anybody, um, and I'll, I'll, I'm going to moderate, essentially, and I have some questions written down. Does anybody have anything they want to share or ask? Yeah, OK, great. I'll be back. Hi, I just have a quick question. My name is Rory. I'm a medical student. very important to me to kind of understand how um, different programs are kind of treat me when I am going through that time period and what will happen, what it does, how that would kind of go. And so how would you recommend kind of understanding the mental health support that program can give you um, deeper 
better than like kind of just what they have on their website or what they can say is reasonable? It's a great question. Uh, for me, I would ask the residents because they're going through that uh, and they can honestly tell you uh, whether or not I would ask the same questions. Uh, do you have any opt-in programs for mental health support? Uh, or is it more of an opt-out, right? Opt-out is like everybody just go through this and uh, you have to actually physically tell somebody, like, like I am share. opting out. Yeah. We're going to try if this works. No? no? There's light. I think the Here. frequency thing, something. I don't know. Uh, I'm sorry. That's okay. I'll project. I'll take loud. <laughs> um, and, and so I think those questions are important. Um, and I would ask a couple of residents. That way, you, number one, it gives you an idea. Is it a safe place for a to talk about it? I will also kind of disassociate some of the conversations about, and, and by the way, this is to acknowledge, thank you for, for, for sharing that, right? Your lived journey for, for, for asking that question. Um, and also, I think that oftentimes what I encounter is that people are worried talking about mental illness because um, it's associated with suicide. Right? There are many other experiences that you're going through that does not necessarily mean suicide. That's one. And number two, all of us here, within the concept, uh, concept of mental health, have ups and downs. And I think that it is a big loss in our parts to just focus on this mental illness and not necessarily the mental health aspect of it. And that's why, again, and I'm gonna, you're going to hear me over and over again, the Stop the State by EM campaign normalizes a lot of these conversations. And so if you can, and, and I, I, would, I can almost predict this, most programs will feel uncomfortable when you ask questions like that. For me, I think one of the, the easiest ways to get an understanding is they may not have all the answers, but are they willing to be brave enough to have that conversation with you, knowing that this is who you are? Because the last thing in my mind when I go into those spaces is, do I have to hide this because nobody seems to be talking about it? Because if we at least brought it up, right? Then should you go there, then it's no longer going to be that thing that keeps on weighing on you as one of the many identities that you're trying to hide because there's so many stigma for all the things that we're doing, many other things that we're doing. And I'll pause there. Yeah, so the answers may be less important than the actual question in itself. Um, Jay, do you have anything to add to that? <coughs> um, Honestly, I think the I think the most important thing is to recognize that seeking help can be either reactionary or preventative. And a lot of the times we recognize that we are in a difficult position and that's when we start reading out for help. But it can take time to seek help. It can take time to get plugged in with resources. There are delays in being seen, there are insurance issues. There's a million reasons that navigating the health system can be complicated even for physicians. And I think one of the things to recognize is we deal with such difficult things in our jobs in a day-to-day -day basis that personally, if it was up to me, I would love everybody who goes through medical training to have opt-out so that it's always just built into your curriculum structure that you're able to seek help. Barring that, I think reaching out for help before you need it, right when you get started, right when you go to a residency program, say, it's going to be a difficult four years or three years. I know it's going to be difficult. Let me just lay the groundwork. I'll be plugged in with somebody, and if I don't need to reach out to them again, that's fine. But if I do, I've already taken that first step. Without work, I stopped the same campaign. I went to see a therapist, and what I learned was that it's not easy. You got to navigate all these things, and then there's also the concept of they're not used to dealing with emergency medicine doctors, right? So you have to prove like. You have to find people that's actually willing to get to that space because oftentimes they hear our story, they're like, oh my gosh, you're doing so much. And I was like, yeah, I know, you don't need to like, validate that, right? Like, I get that, and I might be just not, it, 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 it doesn't work well with me. Like, I, I need you to help me get past that. But they're stuck with this idea that, like, I'm an emergency physician doing all of these, like, big things. And I was like, I get coaching for that. I need you right now to, like, do this. And so that's one of the things that we're working on, right? So, like, to at least get to that space before we are in crisis. For, um, for specifically, um, you know, just because somebody has suicidal ideation doesn't mean that they can't do stuff for themselves. And so there's things that we know that help. Talk about the loneliness. Relationships are key. Holding on to those relationships, whether that's your family, or your medical school, or getting involved in your residence.
presence, building those relationships. And that's the density of relationships is the safety thing. So what you can do is important. Um, the, one of the other things for this is going to say that there's the uh, being having relationships, but also holding on to what has a need to be. What is your purpose? What is your goal? And spending time with with that. I think everybody should have a fabulous plan. Fabulous is going to happen in emergency medicine. Where there is going to be mass shootings, there's going to be people that have all kinds of stuff. And you can prepare for it. Because a lot of talk about joining us here and put it up there. Let's move to the next question. Hi, um, I'm Fred Brown. Uh, I am currently back at Brown. I had the pleasure of working with Dr. Pye for the last few years. Um, just finished up my residency there, and so I'm sort of coming to the end of my first year as a tenure. And uh, I'll, thank you. I'll try to be as eloquent with, with my point here as I can. I've had this sort of growing pain in my stomach and sphere uh, for the last three years ever since COVID really hit, and we we're all dealing with staffing crises at the same time, uh, reporting crises, and um, uh, uh, mental health, I think, in emergency providers, both physicians, nurses, everyone who's there is, is on the decline with all of these things. Um, and and what uh, the point where I really realized how bad it has gone was, was the match we see. Uh, when we've had more unfilled spots in emergency medicine in one year than we had in the past 10 or 15. And to me, that speaks to the fact that people don't want to be there. Right? These students are rotating through the emergency department. And I think there's more than, not just the, the, the crisis of staffing and boarding, I think they're seeing the declining mental health of physicians and providers in the emergency department. And you know, why would they want to work there when they see uh, what kind of stress we're in and how we're all struggling to deal with it? Um, and I don't have a very clear question about that because I would just love to hear insights about our field, emergency medicine, and, and what the future might hold and how, you know, what are we going to do to address it? I think there's no one size fits all to address burnout, and there's no one size fits all to achieve fulfillment. I think that uh, as many um, of our learners are trying to explore emergency medicine, they do see us um, at our roughest times right now. Um, and yet, we have been consistently, like, if there's something that I should not be proud of, it's the fact that emergency medicine has the highest burnout in all of specialties for over a decade now, right? And things change, like critical care. We were tight on them last year. So if you're a critical care in emergency medicine, you were really screwed, right? But this year, you're actually like number five or six. And so things happen. Um, and, and, and I guess what I'm trying to say is, in the, in, the, in the form of belonging and connection, emergency medicine is a very lonely place. There's a lot of the shit in the woods that we deal with when we're taking care of patients. We deal with uncertainty all the time. That's why I think, um, and, and to hammer in that this concept of um, how do we take care of ourselves? We have to really prioritize that, right? We have to think of mental health care, for instance, as this is Dr. Deutsch's point, right? Like, that's, it's just like flossing, right? It's just like going to the dentist. We go to the dentist twice a year to get cleaning, to make sure there's no cavities and whatnot, and yet we don't go to, men to get mental health, like, checkups, because we associate that with madness or whatnot, right? Like, I hope I don't get, like, cavities and whatnot, but I still show up, and it's part of the insurance, right? It's not done yet. Um, Dr. Lush, I can see your hand up. Well, what's, if you guys have more to say about this point, it's fine. By the way, I have recently broken up with my therapist, so it is okay if you're not fitting with your person or they're no longer yeah. fitting your needs, and I will get another one. Uh, but I love everyone sharing of these stories and their experiences, because I think this is how we start to create change. But my question of inquiry, is especially I think, with the population we have here too of med students and residents, how do we create spaces earlier on to find groups that can share and model some of this behavior, not just our webinars and the, and the groups that we have that already are willing to do this, but I think sometimes med schools are still afraid to create panels of their own students that oh are going to talk yes. about this. Because I remember trying to do that when I was a med student, and yeah. I feel old um, that it's been a while, but that's kind of how do we start earlier to create the space so they have more belonging, more of these groups, and can see that they're not alone, and even if they're not 
going to never answer that small though. I know that's specifically what we're here for, but that's kind of my, what would you guys all suggest that we start to make that change? You know, on the on the undergraduate medical student education level, we do career panels all the time. We do career guidance all the time. And what I would love to see is collaboration between GME and UGME to recognize that part of career advisement is mental health. It's not just how do you match into a residency. It's once you match into a residency, how do you not only survive that but thrive? And then how do you build a career where if you're able to find balance and happiness and fulfillment while coping with the fact that a lot of people would deal with burnout. Um, and I would love that to be something that is built into mentorship. But that's so difficult because mentors might not feel empowered to be able to talk to their students about that. I, I wish there was like a magic bullet for that type of issue. Um, but I think doing something like that really takes a real grassroots effort. Um, talking about mental health comes from an individual level. So I, I force myself at times to, to tell residents, you know, like, this is something I've struggled with. And it's really difficult for me, and this is like the thing I'm passionate about, and still I feel awkward talking to trainees of the fact that I deal with mental health issues. I think that's relatively important, right? I think I think the way that we the way we teach people to do a chest tube and the way we teach people to work on chest pain is the same way we teach people this, right? It comes from modeling. So we're not just modeling medical knowledge, we're not just modeling procedural competency, but also modeling, um, modeling um, behavioral and ad attitudinal, if that's a word, um, characteristics, right? And I think so So you modeling for your, uh, for your uh, students and, and residents is, is fantastic. And in many ways, essentially what you're saying is like we're just humanizing ourselves, right? Like, right. We're not those people wearing capes and sol solving all the problems in the world. It's impossible, right? Like, I'm just as human, just like you, right? And I, I do think what I really appreciate in the conversation so far is the idea of making the invisible visible, right? We're just naming it and also like creating people that you can talk to that can normalize that these things actually exist, that these are real things as well, even though we don't see them. Um, and also, I just want to put a plug as well that oftentimes when we think about medical education, there's the, the faculty, there's the residents, the medical students, right? I'm mindful of our staff who actually have institutional knowledge of what's been happening. They have seen us go through our ups and downs, right? Like Bianca knows what I'm like, I'm, I'm underslept because I'm like all over the place. And then she'll grab it's like, hey, are you okay? Have you not slept yet? Those are the people for me when I'm struggling to like find balance that create space. I was like, ah, oh, they see me. I'm not just here to publish and get things done. I'm, like, I'm just as human being as they are. I think um, one of the things that we have to, well, there's two things. One is the story of hope and recovery is so important. And I'm glad to talk about this because so often when we talk about physician suicide, we talk about the ones that die. But there's a lot more other people out there that have thought about it and have had distress and they get through it on their own. And it leaves other people that are, are swimming in the pool thinking that they're drowning all by themselves and not knowing that there are other people. Um, the other thing is I want to talk about language. And I'm going to talk about two things. One is commit suicide, and thank you for changing the slide, um, that it is, when you use the words commit suicide, it is the only committed death. There is no other committed death. And when you think of commit, you think of sin and guilt, may be unchangeable like committing to a college or committing to your marriage and we don't have to say that the media has learned died by suicide it's the same number of letters when they put it in the media and it doesn't make it different from other deaths the other thing that has struck me and i haven't really talked about too much but it strikes me here and when people say mental illness right then i go to a place and I'm not going to talk to you because you're not safe. I think of it as mental distress, psychological distress, situational distress, financial issues, relational distress, whatever. But the process that is coming is a distress problem with suicidal ideation. Now, does it come from a place of true mental illness? Perhaps, but to put all of them together, I think is 
problematic. And I think when we have trainees that are distressed because they put a chest tube in the liver, that it is distress. It is not that they're mentally ill. It's a professional distress phenomenon, and we should, should normalize that. I do want to get to a couple of uh, important questions, um, and then we'll get some more. I want to intersperse sort of key questions. One of the key questions I'd like each of you to try to talk about briefly is, what do we do, right? So when we're that person um, that, you know, some of the years ago Lois approached or, or said, you know, I've not been 100 years and so would cure, like, what do you do with that? So how do you, how do you either respond to somebody that has asked for help or even more uh, difficult, how do you address people uh, that you think may be at risk? I think that's one of the hardest reasons I want to sort of pass it over. How do you address them? You listen. If it's really not that hard, usually it's these thoughts that are overwhelming a person. Um, a guy named Paul Quinnett, he founded the QPR uh, training, and he talks about people with suicidal ideation being like a bucket cup thinking of a coffee cup running around at the bottom. And when you talk to somebody, that tilts the cup, it gives different air. And I think that that's really, really important. You think that there has to be something special, some knowledge that you have to have. But it's really just listening. And you can imagine, I just did that here. My part of a panel is supposed to be comfortable as a difficult, challenging conversation. And yet, there's like, mm, I don't know how to answer that, right? And yet, the answer was simple, listening. Jane, how do you open the conversation? Um, I, think it's, I think it's recognizing that you need to be comfortable inserting yourself into a potentially very uncomfortable scenario. Um, when I notice a change in one of my coworkers, uh, it can be very easy to say, well, they are tired, maybe, it can be really difficult to walk them back into the break room for a second and be like, hey, you seem off, is everything okay? Or you seem off, if there's anything I can do to help you or if you want to talk, I'm here. And that takes a lot of impetus from oneself and it can be really difficult to try and approach that conversation. Um, I, I wish I had some easy way to say that that could be done, but I think the main thing is Developing connections at the workplace is really important because you might not notice if you don't get to know your coworkers, if you don't see what they're going through. Chris, you've taught me this. Are you okay? Yeah. Double tap. No, no, really, are you okay? All right, you do that, right? So, so those double touching yes. is actually very helpful. I so what, what I uh, what, what I have done in the past is is I say, are you okay? And be and be ready for what they're going to say, which is, yeah, yeah you're not fine. And then I say with the same intonation, the same expression on my face, on purpose, but are you okay? And you'd be surprised how many times they, they, they open up the second question, right? And then whatever happens after that should be the listening part, the commiserating part. What I encourage it not to be, my advice to you, is the solution suggestion, right? I think it's the, it's the commiseration piece. There were some other questions, and, I, and I'm, I'm trying not to shut people down, but also uh, to get as much audience as possible. Hi, my name is Katie. I'm actually an emergency nurse, um, but I also am studying to become a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner. Um, so this is something that's really important for me. Um, and one thing that I'm kind of here in my whole DMP project is around was suicide prevention training and how we typically don't do much suicide prevention training, um, with 78% of my department head on. Um, are there any training programs that you guys kind of like in line with this that like do help make things? Like you mentioned QPR. Um, we typically <coughs> tested calm as an intervention, counseling that access to like the means. Um, but that's something that yeah, just kind of wanted to open up. Well, um, thank you. I'm glad uh, you're here at 
as a nurse, our nursing colleagues have terrible stats uh, as well, and I have some connections if you want to look at the, the nursing people. Um, I am a QPR person. I think that we need to uh, learn how to ask. I think lethal means is really, really important how we ask about that, particularly firearms. Um, and there's some good people in, Cal uh, in Colorado that look at different ways that you can ask about firearms in the two-way community. Um, I, I uh, think that there are lots of people in the two-way community. There are some people in the two-way community. Uh, Second Amendment. People that like guns. People that like guns do like to be responsible for their ownership. There are, are a couple people that I know specifically that want to look at, at the issues there. So calm is, is a part of that. And I think everybody should have a safety plan. You can call it a badness plan, you can call it a crisis management plan, um, but we all need to know how, how to do that. So I think that that's really important. Uh, the brown stand uh, or how to we want to adjust that. The Lewis Reed Foundation has a lot of resources. Uh, the website for the National Physician Suicide Awareness Day, uh, that by the way, Lois is uh, not really uh, speaking a whole lot about, but she created that. It's a worldwide, like international thing that happens once a year, um, and she started that. Uh, so check out the website. There were five of us on a phone call, of which Chris Cody was one of them, through court that came up with, with that, and it has expanded and Lorna Green took that on in a number of places. So, and the reason why I wanted it done is because we had spent two years before from when Carlos had died to 18 and we still had trouble um, talking about it. So creating a day made a time to put it into didactics for residency and for us to talk about it. Now there's a whole month of problems. Yeah, there was one more. Um, we have only about uh, a minute left. I'm sorry. I love it when we have more to talk about than we have time. Hello, everyone. My name is Heva. I am from Italy. So I think my case is like the only person with this case. So I'm going to open up a little bit and then we're hoping to hear your own feedback and advice. So my issue is I'm trying, I'm struggling actually to fit in, uh, to have a, a residence spot here. I am working at an ER physician for four years now in Italy after critical care residency in Egypt, so I'm an Egyptian Italian. Um, and everybody is telling me that it's um, almost impossible for someone international to have an emergency residency. So one part is that um, I'm so confident with myself, I know how I, uh, I'm a hard worker, uh, I can bring a lot table, but the other way of it that you have to see information from others to make you see. So I don't know if my case is just um, specific, but um, it's kind of affects my mental health a little bit because um, I don't have much opportunity to be seen, to have the, the space to prove myself. Yeah. I don't know, that's my case, so that's my question. I think if you look around, um, and I know that there's a lot of emotions there, that you can see a lot of people are nodding. So that, that, that need for being seen is very important. Uh, I don't have solutions specifically to uh, your circumstance about trying to get a residency program from, uh, from an international program. However, the being seen part, you don't need to be a doctor uh, to go through that. I think each and every one of us here in this room can acknowledge the fact that that is a very important need. We all need that. So, should I do anything more than what I'm already doing? Or? Yeah, you can call me. <laughs> we'll meet afterwards. I don't know specifically Italy, but I have been doing some stuff with uh, IMG. Uh, and and I, I, probably, I probably can get, I won't be the person, but I may know the person that can help you for that. So with that, we're, we're actually one minute over. Um, we can have more conversation in the back or in the hallway. Two things I would like to say. Um, one is that this is out there. Um, if you are feeling, and I should have opened with this, um, but I'm a little, usually Rita does this piece, uh, she's laid up. Um, but uh, if 
if you need help, ask for help, right? And uh, sometimes even talking about this brings up a whole wealth of emotion, and, uh, and there are resources for you, for your colleagues, for your residents, for your students. Um, this is staffed by physicians that started during COVID, um, and um, these are all uh, volunteer physicians, and it was still working as of when we submitted the slides five weeks ago. Uh, I called it, they answered. Um, and then the last thing I would say is, um, so I, I was able to do two things as court president that I'm immensely proud of. One was to help uh, Lois get this uh, Physician Suicide Awareness Day um, sort of off the ground. And the second was, um, there are resources. If you're at a program, an institution, uh, if you're at a non-academic medical center, it'd be a weird conference to be at, but, um, but there are resources that CORD has um, that we originally called Bomb Survival Packs that have, one of which is sudden resident death, often uh, suicide, but sometimes trauma. Um, there are lists of resources, people to talk to, PDFs, action plans, suggestions, human capital, people you can talk to, you know, my cell phone number is in there. Other uh, former PDs and leaders in emergency medicine, people that you can talk to uh, on short notice to say, you know, there's no playbook for this. Like, what do I do? Well, we, we, wrote, we wrote a very basic playbook. So those resources are there. If you need them and you're not associated with the residency program, you can just call the court office and they will get you uh, the resources because they're because it's people's phone numbers and stuff, it's, it's sort of behind a firewall. You can't just get to it unless you're a member of the board. And with that, I really appreciate you guys taking time out uh, to come listen and share and talk uh, and be vulnerable. Um, I, I really appreciate it. I think you know, increasing the, the depth and density of the relationships that we have is, is going to help us all. Thank you. Thank you to our awesome panel.